I'd like to thank the Borough Park Symposium for inviting me to share this paper. From the time that I was eight years old until my bar mitzvah, I attended a Messianic Jewish congregation on Friday nights and a conservative synagogue on Saturday mornings in the Washington, D.C. metro area. On Sunday mornings, my father and I regularly had breakfast at the local bagel shop. Then we went to Abe's Jewish Bookstore and gift, uh, Abe's Jewish Book and Gift Store on Georgia Avenue, which had a neon sign in the front window that said, if it's Jewish, we have it. I loved going to this Jewish bookstore because my father would buy me any book I wanted. I remember one day when I was about 12 years old, I combed through the books and pulled off the shelf one that looked particularly fascinating. I brought it to the front, placed it on the counter, and Mr. Eulis, the owner, said to me, David, you've chosen a very good book. What was that book? It was The Genius of Paul by Rabbi Samuel Sandmel. I read it as a teenager, and it inspired me to want to learn more about Paul. As a young Messianic Jew, I was encouraged that mainstream Jewish scholars were interested in studying the New Testament and found meaning in Paul's writings. Fast forward 40 years, and I am still reading these kinds of books. In fact, so many new works in this area are being published these days that it is hard to keep track. When I was invited by this symposium to introduce the whole topic of Jewish New Testament interpretation and to do it in 30 minutes, I thought to myself, oy vey! Jewish interpretation of the Brit Chadashah has been going on for 2,000 years. How can I cover almost 20 centuries in half an hour? Thus, out of necessity, I have had to limit the scope of this paper to Jewish New Testament interpretation within the past 50 years or so. Moreover, I'm going to limit the focus to mainstream Jewish scholarship and bracket off the many academic works that Messianic Jewish scholars have contributed over the last half century. In addition, I'm going to focus only on those who have written notable monographs and other book-length studies, rather than those who have contributed articles and essays alone. The fact of the matter is that all Jewish scholars who, special, who specialize in Second Temple Judaism inevitably participate in New Testament interpretation since the New Testament is now widely recognized as Second Temple Jewish literature. Finally, due to the limitations of time, I'm only going to focus on Jewish scholarship on Jesus, Yeshua, and leave Jewish scholarship on Paul for another day. So, if you're ready for the ride, let's begin. Turning the dial back to the late 1960s, Rabbi Samuel Sandmel, who taught at Vanderbilt University and Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, published in 1967 his popular book, We Jews and Jesus. The book is still in print and now includes a preface by his son, Rabbi David Sandmel. In We Jews and Jesus, Sandmel surveys modern Jewish research on Jesus and offers what he describes as a reasoned and reasonable approach to the historical Jesus from a reform Jewish perspective. He covers the works of Isaac Marcus Joost, Joseph Salvador, Heinrich Graetz, Abraham Geiger, Claude Montefiore, and Joseph Klausner. Notably, he does not address the writings of Samuel Hirsch, Emil Hirsch, the son of Samuel Hirsch, Kaufman Kohler, Israel Abrahams, who worked closely with Montefiore from Cambridge, Martin Buber, Edward Strauss, Robert Eisler, 
and Leo Bank. In the end, Sandmel concludes that little, if anything, can be definitively known about the historical Jesus beyond the fact that he was a Jew. Also, in the late 1960s, Shalom ben Choren, a reformed Jew who was actively involved in Jewish-Christian dialogue, published in 1967 his German work, Bruder Jesus. It was translated into English in 2001 under the title, Brother Jesus, the Nazarene through Jewish Eyes. The inspiration for the title came from Ben Horan's teacher, Martin Buber, who famously wrote in his book, Two Types of Faith, from my youth onwards, I have found in Jesus, my great brother. Borrowing this imagery, Ben Horan pens in the preface of Brother Jesus, Jesus is for me an eternal brother. Not only my human brother, but also my Jewish brother. I sense his brotherly hand clasping mine and asking me to follow him. It is not the hand of the Messiah, this hand marked by a wound. It is certainly no divine hand. It is rather a human hand in whose lines the deepest sorrow is inscribed. Ben Horan concluded that Jesus was not a prophet or the Messiah, but a Jewish revolutionary of the heart. Ben Horan viewed Jesus as a first century Torah teacher who focused on the internalization of the law, whereby love constitutes the decisive and motivating factor. Ben Horan described his approach to the New Testament as largely intuitive and arising out of a lifelong familiarity with the text. In 1968, David Flusser, who was professor of early Christianity and Judaism of the Second Temple period at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, published in German and English the first edition of his book, Jesus. This was followed 30 years later by a revised and augmented second edition with R. Stephen Notley. The fourth edition appeared in 2007 under the title, The Sage from Galilee. Flusser, an Orthodox Jew, sought to understand the Jesus of history on the basis of philological and archeological evidence and concluded that the Synoptic Gospels largely preserved the memories of Jesus' life and teachings, Luke most notably. Moreover, they portray Jesus as fully within Judaism. As Flusser put it, Jesus was, quote, a faithful, law-observant Jew, who, while non-sectarian, was closest to the school of Hillel, who preached love, and he led the way further to unconditional love, even of one's enemies and of sinners, unquote. In the late 1970s and 80s, Pinchas Lapid, an Orthodox Jew and visiting professor of New Testament at Göttingen University, wrote two important works on Jesus in German that have yet to be translated into English. They are the Rabbi of Nazareth, Transformations of the Jewish Image of Jesus, 1974, and the Jew Jesus, Theses of a Jew, Answers from a Christian, in 1980. He also co-authored a number of books with well-known Christian theologians about the historical Jesus. These works included Brother or Lord, a Jew and a Christian talk together about Jesus by Hans Kuhn and Pinchas Lapid in 1977. Jesus in Two Perspectives, a Jewish-Christian dialogue between Pinchas Lapid and Ulrich Lutz in 1985, and Encountering Jesus, Encountering Judaism, a dialogue between Karl Rayner and Pinchas Lapid in 1987. One of Lapid's most intriguing books was 
The Resurrection of Jesus, a Jewish Perspective, published in 1982 by Augsburg Fortress Press. In this work, Lapid argues in support of the New Testament account that Yeshua, Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. This notwithstanding, Jesus' resurrection from the dead did not ipso facto mean that he was the Messiah of Israel. For Lapid, Jesus was the savior of the Gentiles, not the Jews, and he only prepared the way for the Messiah. Lapid concludes, any Jewish scholar who examines the New Testament will find that Jesus was undoubtedly a Jew, not just a marginal Jew, nor a lukewarm pro forma Jew, but a true Jew, whose spiritual roots rose out of the prophetic core of Israel's faith, that he was closely related to the Pharisees, that he was a Galilean, and that on top of everything else, he was a master in the art of telling parables. Lapid's motto in reading the Gospels with Christians was, let us to study with one another and discover the earthly Jesus from below. From the 1970s until his death in 2013, Geza Vermesh, professor of Jewish studies at the University of Oxford, devoted himself to the study of the historical Jesus. Central to his task, Vermesh wrote a trilogy of books on the Jewishness of Jesus. In 1983, he wrote, I'm sorry, um, in 1973, he published Jesus the Jew, a historian's reading of the Gospels. Ten years later, in 1983, he wrote Jesus and the World of Judaism, later retitled Jesus in His Jewish Context. A decade after that, in 1993, he released The Religion of Jesus the Jew. Vermesh also wrote a trilogy of books on the life of Jesus. The Nativity, History and Legend in 2006. The Passion, the true story of an event that changed, oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I think I need some tech support here. My apologies. The Passion, the True Story of an Event that Changed Human History in 2005, and Resurrection, History, and Myth in 2008. In addition to these two trilogies, he wrote The Changing Faces of Jesus in 2001, The Authentic Gospel of Jesus in 2003, and Christian Beginnings from Nazareth to Nicaea in 2012. His work is discussed in depth in Hilde Muller's recent study, The Vermesh Quest, The Significance of Geza Vermesh for, G for Jesus Research, published in 2017. Vermesh's interest in the historical Jesus was highly personal. He converted to Catholicism with his parents when he was six years old and became a Catholic priest after World War II. Since he was not permitted to enter the Dominican and Jesuit orders due to his Jewish background, he entered the order of the Fathers of Notre Dame de Sion. Notably, this order was established by two Jewish Catholic priests, the Radisbon brothers. In the 1960s, Vermesh became actively involved in addressing anti-Semitism within the Catholic Church and he made a significant contribution to Vatican II. In 1970, three years before he wrote Jesus the Jew, Vermesh renounced his belief in Jesus and returned to a mainstream Jewish identity, joining the liberal Jewish synagogue of London. Vermesh viewed Jesus as a Galilean chassid who led a renewal movement 
within Second Temple Judaism. As Vermesh put it, the person of Jesus is to be seen as part of first century charismatic Judaism and as the paramount example of the early Hasidim or devout. In 2008, Rabbi Michael Cook, emeritus professor of intertestamental and early Christian literatures at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, published his book, Modern Jews, Engage the New Testament, Enhancing Jewish Well-Being in a Christian Environment. I think that's just such a great title. Cook addresses in this book what he regards to be widespread, self-imposed ignorance of the New Testament in the Jewish world. It is the culmination of a number of publications in which Cook highlights the tendentious nature of much that is written by Jewish scholars about Jesus' life and teachings. Cook's work on the New Testament goes back to the late 1970s when he published his monograph, Mark's Treatment of the Jewish Leaders, in 1978. In 1988, Amy Jill Levine, currently University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt, published her doctoral dissertation, The Social and Ethnic Dimensions of Matthean Social History. In 2006, she wrote her widely acclaimed book, the Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Historical of the Jewish Jesus. And that same year, she she co-edited with Dale Allison and John Dominique Crossan, The Historical Jesus in Context by Princeton University Press. Four years later, Levine and Mark Brettler co-edited the first edition of the Jewish Annotated New Testament published by Oxford with, I think, about 51 contributors who were Jewish scholars. A fully revised and expanded second edition of the JANT appeared in 2017, notably with a section on Messianic Judaism by Yaakov Ariel, who is here with us this evening, among other historical critical essays related to Jesus and New Testament interpretation. In 2014, Levine published a book on Jesus' parables entitled Short Stories by Jesus, the Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. And in 2017, she wrote an exegetical and theological commentary with Ben Witherington entitled The Gospel of Luke for the New Cambridge Bible Commentary Series. The commentary is a wonderful example of how Jesus' research can be advanced through Jewish-Christian dialogue, in this case, between a Methodist evangelical New Testament scholar and a Jewish feminist New Testament scholar who attends an Orthodox synagogue but is not Orthodox in practice, as Levine describes herself. Levine models a similar collaboration with Warren Carter in their 2013 book, The New Testament Methods and Meanings, which has four chapters devoted to the Gospels. Of all the Jewish New Testament scholars mentioned in this paper, Levine is the only one who, through her writings, has attempted to resource Gentile Christians in their observance of the church's holy days. In 2018, Levine published Entering the Passion of Jesus, a Beginner's Guide to Holy Week, a study of the biblical texts related to the week of Jesus' death. Its sequel appeared in 2019, Light of the World, oh, excuse me, sorry about that. Light of the World, a Beginner's Guide to Advent, a study of the biblical texts related to Jesus' birth. In 2022, Levine is scheduled to publish her book, Jesus for Everyone, Not Just Christians, by Harper One. Levine is one of the most prolific Jewish New Testament scholars today who specializes in Jesus research. 
she maintains that Jesus's life and teachings need to be understood within the context of Second Temple Judaism. At the same time, Levine regards the Gospels as texts that plant, that quote, plant seeds that with certain types of fertilizer yield an anti-Jewish growth, unquote. In 1988, Paula Fredrickson, Aurelio Professor of Scripture Emerita at Boston University and Distinguished Visiting Professor of Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, published From Jesus to Christ, The Origins of the New Testament Images of Christ by Yale University Press. This was followed in 1999 with Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, A Jewish Life and the Emergence of Christianity. In 2002, Fredrickson co-edited with Adela Reinhardt's The Important Work, Jesus, Judaism, and Christian Anti-Judaism, Reading the New Testament After the Holocaust. Her most recent book on the Jewish context of the Gospels is her 2018 publication, When Christians Were Jews, The First Generation, by Yale University Press. Fredrickson's historical reconstruction of Jesus' life and teachings locates him fully within first century Judaism, and she regards all of the New Testament writers as being Jewish. From her perspective, Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah. Rather, the messianic attribution that led to his death was essentially a misunderstanding on the part of his disciples and others. Fredrickson was raised Catholic and converted to Orthodox Judaism. In 1993, Adela Reinhardt's professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at Ottawa University published her monograph, The Word in the World, The Cosmological Tale in the Fourth Gospel. A decade later, in 2002, she released her book, Befriending the Beloved Disciple, a Jewish reading of the gospel of Judaism and Christian, oh, excuse me, of the gospel of John. That same year, as already mentioned, she co-edited with Paul Fredrickson, Jesus, Judaism, and Christian anti-Judaism. In 2007, Reinhardt's turned her focus to how Jesus is portrayed in the entertainment in industry and published Jesus in Hollywood by Oxford University Press. Returning to the focus on Jews and Judaism and John, Reinhardt's wrote in 2018, cast out of the covenant, Jews and anti-Judaism in the gospel of John. The crux of the matter for Reinhardt's is this. The gospel of John presents its readers, listeners, and interpreters with a serious problem. How can we reconcile the gospel's exalted spirituality and deep knowledge of Judaism with its portrayal of the Jews as the children of the devil who persecuted Christ and his followers. For Reinhardt's, the fourth gospel is profoundly anti-Jewish and supersessionist in content. Finally, in 2018, Reinhardt's published an edited volume entitled The Gospel of John and Jewish-Christian Relations. In these works on John, Reinhardt's primarily focuses on literary criticism and anti-Jewish tendencies in the story, rather than questions related to the historical Jesus. In 2012, Daniel Boyeran, professor of Talmudic culture at the University of California at Berkeley, released his book, The Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ. It is a small book, but it powerfully argues that the gospel's depiction of Jesus as a divine Messiah who suffers and dies for the sins of Israel was not a departure from Jewish thought, but a reflection of its pervasiveness during the Second Temple period. As Boyeran puts it, the reasons that many Jews came to believe that Jesus was divine was because they were already expecting that the Messiah, the Christ, would be a God-man. This expectation was part and parcel of Jewish tradition. 
Boyeren's thesis has been widely embraced by Jewish scholars who work in the field of New Testament and Second Temple Judaism. In 2013, Isaac Oliver, associate professor at Bradley University, released Torah Praxis After 70 CE, reading Matthew and Luke Acts as Jewish texts, published by Moore Zebeck. Like Boyeren, Oliver argues for a fully Torah-observant Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels. Oliver is a Reformed Jew who previously identified as a Jewish follower of Jesus. In 2011, oh, there's Torah praxis. In 2011, Zev Garber, Emeritus Professor and Chair of Jewish Studies and Philosophy at Los Angeles Valley College and an Orthodox Jew, published an edited volume entitled The Jewish Jesus, Revelation, Reflection, Reclamation by Purdue University Press. Its essays reflect Garber's view that the incarnate, the incarnate Christ of Christian belief lived and died a faithful Jew. The modern Jew can identify with the faith and fate of Jesus, but not faith in Jesus. In 2020, Garber and Kenneth Hansen, director of the Judaic Studies Program at the University of Central Florida and a convert to Judaism, who has had a positive experience with Messianic Judaism, published a book entitled Judaism and Jesus. One element that makes this book exceptional is its commitment to include Messianic Jewish scholars in the conversation. In the preface, Garber and Hansen note, both of us have come together in order to probe the multiple issues, both theological and historical, relating to Jesus or Yeshua, and also to challenge the artificial separation between Jewish, Christian, and Messianic Jewish scholarship. The stereotypes developed by practitioners of both faiths over the past two millennia need to be challenged, and no one should be excluded from the interchange of ideas. That includes Messianic Jews, who are generally looked upon with a good deal of suspicion by the greater Jewish community. This book represents a new and welcome development in mainstream Jewish Jesus studies. Along these lines, Professor Garber has invited Dr. Mark Kinzer, Dr. Helene Dallaire, and and me to participate in a review session on his new book at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference in November of this year. The three of us will be, pre will be presenting response papers. As a final note on recent Jewish Jesus studies to highlight, Rabbi Walter Homolka, professor of modern Jewish thought at the University of Potsdam, has written two outstanding works that detail the history of Jewish Jesus scholarship. The first is Jesus Reclaimed, Jewish Perspectives on the Nazarene, published in 2015. And the second is Jewish Jesus Research and its Challenge to Christology Today, published in 2017. There is also Matthew Hoffman's From Rebel to Rabbi, published in 2007, which devotes the first chapter to the quest for the Jewish Jesus. In conclusion, Jewish New Testament interpretation is an exciting field that is breaking new ground and producing a new generation of Jewish scholars. Moreover, we are beginning to see mainstream Jewish scholars and Messianic Jewish scholars coming together to learn from each other about the Jewish Jesus, as we are doing at this very symposium. This is something that would have been unthinkable 50 years ago. I'm grateful that I can be here at this conference with my daughter, Elisa, who will be arriving this evening. She is a third generation Messianic Jew and gets the privilege of living at a time when she can see this dialogue taking place. 
May Elisa's generation build on all of this. And in the immortal words of Captain Picard, boldly go where no one has gone before. Thank you. Before we have the first question, our speakers have asked if they could just have a moment or two to make one statement about their excellent papers. I just want to make the observation and let everyone know that David and I did not consult with each other in writing these two papers. So the overlap that you see is, uh, I think, a reflection of a natural overlap, which I think is important to observe before we begin to have a question. That's great. And David? That was, you don't want to overlap with Daryl on this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, our first question. I know when the Dabru Ahmet uh, presentation came out in the Times many years ago, people like John Levinson reacted very negatively, and there was a reaction against it. Has there been any radical react reaction in the scholarly Jewish community against the, Jewish re against the idea of a Jewish reclamation of Jesus? In the Jewish scholarly community. Uh, either, actually, either community. Has there been, uh, uh, aside from the idea that things are, are moving forward as you pr presented so artfully, has there been uh, a, a, re a repudiation of this, uh, a resistance? Yeah. To my knowledge, no, in, in general. I'm sure that there, you know, there there must be someone out there who's written something to you know, oppose this direction, but it's almost, like, it's almost like the arrow's been shot and there's so much thrust within, within the New Testament and Second Temple Jewish studies more widely that it's just very difficult, I think, to return to the pre-existing way of thinking. There's just too much research that's come out in support of this direction. Yeah, and if I can add, the um, Enoch group that I mentioned is full of a mixture of folks. Um, Daniel Boyarin, who uh, I noted earlier, is, has been a part of that group in the past. Michael Stone, who's well known from Israel, has been a part of that group. Um, so there, are, there is significant Jewish and Christian participation in this Enoch seminar, which is a study, kind of a either a topic at a time or a set of books at a time focus on given topics. It's been going on now for not quite 10 years and uh, well, actually maybe a little longer now. And, uh, and you know, they'll do a focus on a particular writing or on a particular topic uh, and they run the gamut of things in terms of what they cover. They're now meeting internationally uh, I think every two years, and then on the off years, younger scholars are meeting as well. And then they now have begun having meetings uh, in association with the Society for Biblical Literature meetings in November. So this is a, this is a constant conversation that is taking place in, in a variety of areas. Okay. All right. Let's start lining up. Mark? This is a question for Daryl that is, is intended more to allow you to amplify in something that you didn't have uh, sufficient time, uh, I think, to cover. Um, you spoke about the new perspective on Paul and, uh, and covered the, the key figures associated with that, E.P. Sanders and Dunn and uh, Tom Wright. Um, but something has emerged after that, which at first was called the radical new perspective on Paul, and then later on was uh, was changed uh, in terminology to be called the the Paul within Judaism um, school, associated with people like um, Mark Nanos and Paula Fredrickson and um, and others. And I'm wondering if you could say something more about that because it was uh, a significant offshoot and uh, development from the the new perspective. Yeah, um, Mark, not really, um, and I probably should have included well, that. David, uh, yeah. yeah, David could too. Yeah, um, because um, 
some of, some of that got some of what got in the way of that is figuring out where to put certain people in the conversation because we were assigned Christian and Jewish and what do we do with those messianics? Do you know where do they go? So anyway, um, so no, but they're they're actually a, the whole new perspective discussion is not done at all. Um, no pun intended. Um, the um, the the variety of things that have come. I mean, the whole discussion about post-supersessionism, which is another dimension of the equation, is walking into some of this as well in terms of where New Testament studies is the attempt to ask the question, you know, how, how thoroughly Jewish is Paul's material is what is motivating the conversation. And you literally have a spectrum of views on where where do you put Paul in that in that in that spectrum? And you've got people putting him kind of all over the map. David. Yeah, <clears throat> I would just add that um, it's interesting that the term radical new perspective was a term that was used to describe the that that way of thinking that you know Paul was a Torah observant Jew as being you know to the far end of the spectrum. And I think what, what is very significant is that the Society of Biblical Literature conference um, included a, a, what was it? A, a, maybe, uh, what was the official name for it? A, um, a group. Group, Mark? Well, the Paul within Judaism group within the Society of Biblical Literature, which has been going on for a number of years now, essentially helped to normalize that, that perspective within the academic world. And so the, the nomenclature to describe that school of thought began to shift from the radical new perspective to Paul within Judaism. It's referring to the same school of thought, but it reflects a kind of movement among many scholars toward acknowledging the, uh, that way of being able to read the New Testament, though not everyone buys into it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, one, then two. Uh, this question is for Dr. Rudolph. A couple of the authors that you had mentioned, you indicated that they had come to faith in Yeshua at one time, but eventually seemed to fall away. Um, did they give any indication of why in their writings? Did their, or did the perspe perspective of their writings radically change? In the case of Vermesh, I do think he has a biography or autobiography. Um, and so it's been a long time since I've read through it. So I'd, I would imagine there you would find that, that information. With some of the others, um, they have intended to to write about their journey. Though it, in, I think in all the cases that I mentioned, their journeys are, are public. They don't try to hide those areas or I would not have mentioned them. So, yeah. Okay. Dr. Reitman? For both of you, um, some of the scholars you, you mentioned uh, were and are very great Dead Sea Scrolls scholars, like Jim Chasworth, Princeton, uh, Geza Vermesh at Oxford, and Professor David Flusser, that also was uh, my teacher at the Hebrew University. So in this sense, how you see the tremendous significance the Dead Sea Scrolls they made for this new approach to Jesus, uh, Paul, in the context of Judaism in the Second Temple? Well, um, you know, I often, I often say to my students that if we hadn't found the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm not sure um, Jewish, Jewish Jesus studies would have changed very much or New Testament would have changed very much. What the Dead Sea Scrolls did, and you know this as well as anybody, is um, it opened up the world of Second Temple Judaism in the land at the very time point that we are talking about. And, uh, and so the fact that so many of these scholars were, 
I'm going to use a, a sports analogy because I can't get through a talk without doing it at least once. And that is they were switch hitters, which means they were fully immersed in the Dead Sea Scrolls study, and they were also very, very aware of what was going on in the New Testament at the same time. Now, most people don't operate that way. And, you know, I consider myself to be a New Testament person primarily. I dabble in Jewish backgrounds, but I'm not, you know, I haven't, I haven't done the kind of direct firsthand work with Dead Sea Scroll materials that some of the people that you mentioned have done. And so they bring a dual expertise to the topic, and in the midst of doing that, they see things, generally speaking, that other people um, never dreamed of seeing because they didn't know it was even there, what the connections were. The other thing that's happened, I didn't mention this, but I think this is extremely important, um, is when I first started studying, now this is a, when you make this remark, you, you get nervous, but when I first started studying, and I used to teach a course on Jesus, and I would bring in the books that would uh, be involved in Jewish studies on one particular class and walk them through all the core kind of firsthand volumes that touch on the period that we're talking about. And if you, if you don't put the Talmud in there, which, which of course is later, it's still a stack about this high when you put all those volumes on. And the point I was making to students is there is a lot of stuff to look at here. Okay? Um, but what's changed is, is about uh, two-thirds of that material was only available in certain languages, by which I mean not English. And so, um, so that was a problem. About five years ago when I taught that class, same class period, same goal in teaching, I didn't have to bring in a single hardbound volume. Everything was online, and almost all of it was in English. So what that means is, is that the accessibility of this material for people to look at it and see what's there has become far more accessible in my lifetime than it was back in the 1970s when I, well, 1980s, 70s when I was a student and started teaching. So, um, and, and the impact of that, I think, is, is significant because it gave access to at least a level of understanding, potentially, that many people didn't have. And, and it also opened up the discussion beyond those who had direct first-hand language, uh, first-hand knowledge of some of the languages that are involved. So all of that changes the game a little bit, which, which is dangerous and, and, uh, and significant at the same time. It's significant because it opens up the discussion to a lot more people. It's dangerous because sometimes the nuances of language do matter in some of these discussions. So, um, so that's, a, that's a reality that also has come in to the picture as well. And because of that greater accessibility, you know, I can now, if I'm at home researching something and I want to check a text, it used to be I had to be in a specific location to check that text. I had to be at a library. I had to physically go there. Now it's one click away. Now, almost for almost everything. I would, I would echo what Daryl has said and maybe add that in, in the case of mainstream Jewish scholars and, in the, and as well many Christian scholars, I think after the Dead Sea Scroll scholarship began coming out and became re, more and more researched, that there was an increasing recognition of the diversity of Second Temple Judaism. And I think prior to that, it was easier to, to begin to, it was easier to, to view Yeshua, to view Jesus against a kind of monolithic per, way of viewing Judaism in the first century. And so you, you could end up with Judaism, it was easier for Judaism to be a kind of negative foil in relation to Yeshua's life and ministry. But after the Dead Sea Scrolls became more, uh, more prominent in scholarship and, and there was this recognition of the diversity of first century Judaism, then people could place Yeshua within that diversity. And so at certain places where he departed from the Pharisees, that didn't mean he burst the bounds of Judaism. It just meant that he, he had a different sectarian view or 
a non-sectarian view that was over and against the Pharisaic view. But there was also a Sadducean view, there was an Essene view, there were these other views. And I, I do think that, that for scholars like Geza Vermesh and, and, um, and, and your teacher, um, David Flusser, that, that was very significant in their scholarship. And so, and I think it continues to be today for the Messianic Jewish community because we want to place Yeshua within that diversity and acknowledge that, you know, he, he did not burst the bounds of Judaism, but he was within that broad spectrum. Yeah. When, when I teach Acts um, and we get to Paul's experience on the Damascus Road, I asked my students, was this a conversion or not? And then about the next 60 to 75 seconds is this long period of reflective silence that comes over everyone as they recognize really the direction of the question and what it means to think through, well, is conversion the right language or is this, is this Paul believing he has found the faith that he's had all along in some sense or another. And so, um, and that is a very live conversation that takes place in many scholarly circles about uh, the significance of the portrayal of Acts. 50 years ago, I think it would be fair to say that question would never have come up. Uh, and, and what has triggered that shift is this awareness of the internal conversations that were exist that have come that we now see existed within Judaism of that time about a variety of issues, including those that touch on apocalyptic eschatology, restoration theology, put in you know whatever you want in the blank, and 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 the fact that you can find writers who are all over the place. When I one final personal story, when I did my dissertation, which was the use entitled. Luke's use of the Old Testament for Christology at Aberdeen. The thing that blew me away as I went from passage to passage to passage to passage to passage was how consistently something that I had thought was a particular Christian reading of a text showed up in Second Temple Judaism or in the early rabbis somewhere. And all of a sudden I realized this is not as distinctive a set of thought patterns as I had previously believed. And it was one of the most eye-opening experiences of the topic that I worked on. Okay. Thank you, next question. I got one question for, one question that each of you could answer if that's okay. So David, I'm wondering as you were going through the list, obviously you were just listing them, other than uh, Boyarin, has anybody else, other than maybe Siegel and Boyarin, approached the idea of the deity of Jesus? You know, and Daryl, um, the second part of the question would be in the, you know, the Enoch seminars, because of the connection between Enoch and Metanon. Has that door, you know, been open to, to the deity of a uh, Jewish Messiah? Yeah, this is a complex question because uh, what I'm raising doesn't necessarily automatically imply the deity of Jesus. What it does imply is a discussion about whether there is someone who, could, who is so deeply involved in the deliverance process that they share some degree of honor in heaven. And, and just to, uh, real quickly, um, the exegoge of Ezekiel has Moses... Uh, as the recipient of a dream in which he is told to sit on the thrones, that's plural, of God. There's only one text where that, te where that expression is plural, and it's in Daniel 7, which is interesting. The second set of texts where you get a, a consideration of this possibility is uh, in First Enoch, a whole series of texts about the Son of Man. And that the, there's a huge debate about how the Son of Man is seen in the context of First Enoch and whether deity is the right um, category to place, but he certainly is an extremely highly exalted figure. I can say it that way. Um, the third text uh, where this gets discussed um, 
well, actually, there are, there are, there are several texts where this comes up. Um, are the views of certain early rabbis, uh, Akiva perhaps being the most famous, in which you see the debate, in which he believes that David, it's possible for David to sit on a throne in heaven, that that's what Psalm 110.1 means, to which the sages reply, that's always a, a corporate response from the, from the community, um, Akiva, how long will you profane the Shekinah? There's, a, there's an act of offense that's seen in having that view. So there are positive views that come out of these texts and negative views that come out of the text. My favorite is Third Enoch, where Metatron is giving a tour, Enoch of heaven, and he refers to himself as the lesser Yahweh. Uh, well, I like to think, if you want to think about this, think of Burger King. You got Whopper and then you got Whopper Jr., okay? So, um, and, and he gets called in by, uh, by God for, for what I describe as a talk. You know, when I was a child, my dad used to call me in for talks, and the one thing that I learned is it wasn't going to be a conversation. He had something he wanted to communicate very clearly to me. And that's exactly what this is. Um, this is God uh, rebuking Metatron for even thinking he could compare himself in one way or another to, uh, to God, to, to himself. And so you see in the text this array of views, some entertaining the possibility that there is someone who's a very, very highly exalted figure, so highly exalted that the possibility is they could even share the platform with God. Let me say it that way. Okay? And then there are other set of texts that go, no way, no way could that be tolerated. And so this variation that we've been talking about emerges from these texts, but what it shows is there are people doing this kind of thinking in the Second Temple period so that when Jesus does and says some of the things at least he is attributed as saying, there is a backdrop for that that, that has it make more sense than he's speaking entirely kind of out of the blue and on his own. And that's a very, very important space to have created for the conversations that these texts are generating about what is going on. Yeah, I was looking at my notes because um, in 30 minutes I couldn't get get all the uh, scholars and publications uh, out that I wanted to, but um, you know, in looking through the, the remaining list that I had, none of, none of those who've published books over the past 50 years, um, beyond Boyeran and you mentioned Siegel, Alan Siegel, um, tend to focus on the Christology issue. They, I think as I mentioned in the presentation, there seems to be more of an interest in the, in the humanity of Yeshua, in the, the life and the teachings of Jesus. You know, maybe there's a discomfort. I'm, I'm not sure what the motivations would be, um, but there's definitely far less scholarship along those lines. There are essays and, and, um, and journal articles engaging Boyeran's work uh, by Jewish scholars, but very little in the way of book-length studies that I'm aware of. One thing that is a growing area in Jewish, mainstream Jewish literature, interestingly, though, is, is relating to the, 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 the Christology, the New Testament Christology, um, from the perspective of Kab Kabbalistic thought. So there have been several publications recently addressing that. Um, I think some associated with the Hartman Institute. And um, so, but of course, there you're dealing with later Jewish thought. You're not dealing with Second Temple Judaism. It's hard to, you know, to trace it back that far. So I think of Jewish scholars who do engage Christological issues, I think there is a growing interest in, in trying to relate it to Jewish mysticism. Yeah, and if I can just add one other element since we're dealing with categories here. There is a whole series of discussions of Jewish studies related to what might be called angelology and the way in which angels function in heaven that, be, that come into some of these conversations as well. Um, and that's a tricky area, but just to show you again the importance of an area like this, again, something that I say to my students is if you actually read 
uh, the Tanakh by itself and you ask, what kind of theology of angels and demons could you develop out of this material? Okay, it would be very, very short and very, very small. But if you read the Second Temple Jewish material for that topic, you've got all kinds. Of, I mean, First Enoch is by itself is almost a textbook in this area in terms of naming people, what the, what the different functions, the level of, and so I tell my students, when you see a phrase in Ephesians like principalities and powers, you're not getting help with that phrase from the Tanakh. You're getting help with that phrase from what's been written in the Second Temple Jewish period about what this would allude to, et cetera, which illustrates one other point that's huge that has been underlying everything that David and I have been saying, which is the role of backgrounds for the cultural scripts that are embedded in the New Testament. Cultural scripts are the elements of background where I as a writer and you as a reader share what is being said because we understand the world in which that operates. My illustration for a cultural script is the cowboys are going up to the frozen tundra to melt the cheese heads, a second sports illustration. Okay, if you're in the United States, you know exactly what that means, even if you view it as a lie. Okay, um, but, but if you're in, in the Middle East or Saudi Arabia learning English as a second language, you could look up every word of that sentence, which is a perfectly beautiful English sentence in one sense, and you could look up every word and have no idea what that sense means because it's a cultural script. So the cult, what, what this background study is doing, what, it, what, it's, what it's fueling is the ability to surface where these cultural scripts are residing in the text and what those cultural scripts may mean, which has one other element to it, and that is sometimes I don't need to say anything to understand the significance of an action. And the other thing that's happening in New Testament studies as we think about Christology in some of these areas is we're giving much less attention to the significance of titles and much more attention to the significance of particular actions which rely on these cultural scripts in order to understand what exactly is going on and what the significance of what Jesus is doing actually means. So all of this is fueling, is fueling these conversations uh, which are taking place. And frankly, in many cases, it's Second Temple Jewish texts of one sort or another of their combination that's helping us to get a sense of what may be going on. All right, next question. This is for Dr. Rudolph. Um, I'm curious what the Jewish reclamation uh, movement has had in regards of impact on the Orthodox Jewish scholarship. So we've talked about how um, there's been a negative monolithic uh, caricature of Second Temple Judaism in Christian circles, but perhaps there has been a positive monolithic understanding of it in Orthodox circles. How has this scholarship impacted uh, Orthodox scholarship? Well, just so I understand the, the question, when you say a, a positive impact, what do you mean exactly? Perhaps looking at the, the Mishnah and the chain of tradition and saying that there was a, an orthodoxy that has gone back um, monolithically uh, back to Sinai and um, th that kind of thing. I'm, not, I'm still not quite sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase it just so that I can make sure I'm responding? So the, the scholarship has been bringing out that there are different um, um, sects and versions of Judaism in the, second cent in the first century, including the Qumran community, which was not really thought of before the, um, um, sure it was in Josephus and whatnot, but now those different sects have now come to the fore. So how has that impacted uh, the way that uh, perhaps not uh, reform Jewish scholars um, have looked at this period, but uh, those coming from um, an orthodox perspective. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I think that even among orthodox Jewish scholars like John Levinson, Daniel Boyeran, Amy Jo Levine, we're seeing, we're seeing a, an ability to embrace that understanding without it being threatening I think in most of most cases we're not dealing with ultra-orthodox scholars. 
you know, who would generally hold a, an older perspective, who would, you know, view rabbinic Judaism as more normative um, historically. But I think among modern Orthodox scholars, there seems to be a, a wide open reception of this way of thinking. Um, it's also worth mentioning Michael Visegrad never wrote you know, an entire book about Yeshua, about Jesus, but he wrote many essays that address this, this area. And he dealt with issues of Christology, he dealt, he dealt with issues of uh, the parting of the ways, he dealt with issues related to you know, where, does, where does the New Testament fit in relation to this, um, you know, this uh, pluriform Second Temple Judaism, and ultimately brought it into kind of theological terms, um, that, so that he was part of this dialogue. I think there, are, I think that that there aren't many scholars like Visegrad who are willing to kind of enter into Jewish Christian dialogue as an Orthodox scholar. Amy Jo Levine is one exception. I would say that's where that's where probably the limitations are. We just don't see as many Michael Visegrads who are willing to kind of sit down with, with uh, Christian scholars or even Messianic Jewish scholars. So I would say that's a, a next step. Like once you recognize that diversity and you, you want to affect change to kind of sit down at the table with people who are from a different religious perspective. Hopefully, in the years to come, we'll see more of that. And excitingly, at the symposium, you know, we, we have a number of mainstream Jewish scholars, including some who are Orthodox. Uh, for, for either or both of you, uh, probably most everyone in this room could name half a dozen streams of Judaism in the Second Temple period. I wonder whether anybody has done an extensive study of what those various streams might be beyond the Sadducees and the Pharisees and Shammai and Hillel and Akiva and the others. Has anybody done a study to identify the characteristics or even the existence of multiple perspectives and practices in Second Temple Judaism? There's a very good book, as I recall, it's, the title is something like The Flourishing of Sects in Second Temple Judaism. It might be by Baumgarten, possibly. If you Google it, I'm sure you can find it. I found that book to be very helpful. The, the challenge is that we just don't, with a lot of these minor sects or these sects that um, we, we don't read about much in Josephus or, you know, Philo, we just have so little data to work with. And so a lot of, a lot of the work is conjecture that, you know, that we see, or, or it's just simply the chapter is very short because we just don't have much in the way of textual or archaeological evidence to work with. Yeah. The, the volume that I alluded to by Carson O'Brien and Cypher, it called Variegated Gnomism, and there's a rest of the title, I don't remember exactly what the full title is off the top of my head. But the way it works is it, it, it's arguing a couple of things and it's doing it, it's two volumes, so it's probably total around 800 pages or so. Um, it, it goes through various works, many, well many of the essays go through individual works one at a time analyzing what their view of Judaism seems to be based upon what it is that they that written, and uh, and the reason the title is variegated, which is a fancy name for a variety of nomisms, um, is because as they do the analysis and they're wrestling with the um, law grace continuum, what's the relationship between the function of law and the presence of grace in the language of these works? Um, it's it's, it's showing that some of them are pushing on this end of the scale and other works are pushing on that end of the scale. In fact, they argue that there are certain works that actually reflect the kinds of complaints that traditionally Christians have given to Judaism all the way over to works that don't show 
very much touch of that kind of an argument against them at all. So that shows you the range. So the closest thing that I'm aware of, of something that is going in that kind of direction is, um, is the volume on uh, variegated numbers. And let me mention something else that just popped in my head because we had the question earlier about Christology. Um, there is a very solid work on Second Temple Messianic expectation edited by um, Neusner, Friedrichs, and I'm forgetting one of the, one of the sub-editors. But anyway, it, it does the same thing with Messianism. It goes through works, in, in some cases a period of time, but more often a work at a time to ask the question, what kind of Messianic expectation does this particular Second Temple Jewish work display? And puts that together, also pointing to the variety of kinds of Messianic expectation that is coming out of the material. So, so what is going on, the reason I mention this is because what is going on is there are studies, that, and I alluded to this in my presentation, there are studies that are asking the question very much with New Testament issues in mind. But there's a whole other layer of studies that are asking these questions strictly with Second Temple Judaism in mind. They aren't even, in some cases, if they cross over the New Testament, it's as an afterthought or something like that. And so uh, to get your hands around this discipline, which has become its own discipline in, in very many ways in the last 50 years, you have to be reading in both of those areas. You can't get away with just reading the stuff that people are writing in relationship to the New Testament because oftentimes the monograph work that I talked about and that kind of thing is actually totally focused on just trying to understand what in the world is going on in the Jewish world of this time. And that is a challenging question as it stands. It's the precept to the question that you asked. And in some cases we can get some sense of what's going on. In other cases, uh, we struggle to do so because, again, the other thing to always remember about ancient work is you've only got a very small selection of the total material that was produced at the time. You're always dealing with a, with a, uh, with a leftover that has survived. And so in that sense, um, you're struggling to get your hands on what all that could have been available had you, had you lived in that time period. Okay, we're, we're sorry, David. We are uh, running out of time. And so, uh, David, this will be the last question, and I'll ask you to uh, answer in like a couple of minutes, OK? I'm just curious. Uh, a number of year ago, years ago, I read the, was really impacted by Sander Gilman's the, on Jewish self-hatred, where he talked about the relationship between the historical Jewish self-hatred and Christian anti-Semitism. And I'm thinking that as you were speaking, that I'm saying, wow, this Dead Sea Scroll is door that opened has helped. Can you explain or are you familiar with the idea that this is not only scholarship, but it has kind of given permission that helps to heal Jewish self-hatred with all the diversity of that period, that, that it wasn't just as black and white as history has painted it to be, and it has contributed to this struggle with Jewish self-hatred and Christian anti-Semitism is that, can you address that? Well, I'm not sure I can fully answer your question, but I would, I would say this. Um, Amy Jo Levine has a wonderful article in which she talks about, the, she addresses the question, what are the reasons why Jewish scholars and Jewish people more generally uh, have become more and more interested in the Jewish Jesus. What are the reasons for this? And one of, one of the comments that she makes, which I, I thought was just very insightful, was that for many years in Hebrew school, and she, she points this out, um, the teacher would go, would go through Jewish history and then get to the Maccabees and then, and then talk about the Maccabees and then, and then go to the Mishnah. So you're skipping over, like, you know, the whole Second Temple period. And so uh, Shai Cohen ended up writing a book called From Maccabees to the, to the uh, Mishnah to address this kind of gap within Jewish history. And Amy Jo Levine makes the point that, that the interest in the 
in the reclamation of the Jewish Jesus is in part to fill a gap of Jewish history. It's kind of a healing in some ways. And um, not just with respect to the Second Temple period, but it's also, she points out, um, there are many Jewish scholars who are interested in the Jewish Jesus because the Christian scholars that they're interacting with or the Christian friends that they're interacting with uh, re regard this Jesus to be so important. So the Jewish person in their security steps out and whether a scholar or a non-scholar studies this Jewish Jesus to better understand the faith of their friend or their colleague. And that it also is a kind of healing experience. The one, let me just add 30, real, sec 30 seconds. No problem. Another dimension of this is the effect of the Holocaust on Christian guilt that has existed soci sociologically, which opened up a, a renewed desire to have respect for what it is that the Jewish heritage represented. Okay, let's thank our panelists. <laughs>